Live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists, this is Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. Two major weather headlines clashing this hurricane season, one helping storm formation while the other inhibits it. Meteorologists, climatologists, they are trying to find out which one is going to win out in the end. We're going to be nerding out today in the Stream Center as we talk rising ocean temperatures versus El Nino on Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. Hello there to you folks. JB here with you live in the Stream Center alongside our three experts across the top of your screen, meteorologists Rebecca Barry and Amanda Holly joining me in the Stream Center. And then our featured meteorologist joining us from Birmingham, Alabama today. It's Alex Puckett of our sister station, WIAT CBS 42. We're gonna all going to be nerding out and before we do we want to let you know there is nothing going on right now in the tropics but it gives us an opportunity to talk about something that meteorologists have been talking about behind the scenes for weeks months now trying to figure out amanda holly which of these two weather headlines is going to win el nino or rising temperatures so we're going to send you over to the wall because we need you to be professor amanda holly and explain <laughs> to us exactly what's going on here yeah so th competing factors is really what we're calling it right now. Luckily, things are quiet right now. They've been relatively quiet, but there's been a lot of talk about El Nino over the past few months, and that is because the forecasts have called for El Nino to develop. Well, last week it was officially declared that El Nino is now solidly in place, and that typically inhibits storm formation. However, even though we're expecting this to be a strong El Nino, there are a couple of things going that actually lead to more storms forming. So we got a kind of battle of the two factors, and this is really what we're going to be looking at all season long, which one is going to win out. It could be that only time will tell, and we're not really going to know until the end of hurricane season. But again, the competing factors being strong El Nino. Does it develop by the time we get to uh, the main part of hurricane season that could lead to fewer storms. And we'll talk about why here in just a minute. But we also have really warm water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. We're talking record warm water temperatures and actually water temperatures that have spiked over the past two weeks to uh, these record levels. And that could lead to more fuel for the storms that do form. And on top of both of those things, we actually are looking at the possibility of having a, an active West African monsoon season, which that just means those tropical waves that we track coming off the coast of Africa. Yeah, there's going to be more of them. So the question will be, can those tropical waves feed off of the fuel of the warm water temperatures in the Atlantic, or is El Nino going to inhibit it? This is El Nino right here. You might, might be wondering why we're looking at the Pacific Ocean. Well, we track El Nino by looking at the difference in the water temperature, the anomaly in the Pacific Ocean near the equator. All of that red means that it's really warm there, and that is why El Nino was declared. It actually leads to stronger atmospheric winds in the main development region for the Atlantic Ocean, where we see our tropical development for hurricane season. So stronger atmospheric winds, yeah, that would shear out any storms that try and form. But again, the competing factor being those water temperatures. Now we do look at the storms that have formed during El Nino years, and in this region, you can see there's not a lot over the past 30 years. But there are storms that have impacted the United States uh, during El Nino, uh, during El Nino years, some of those being significant storms. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute as well. But wanted to show you the competing factors here because the record warm water temperatures, if we see enough of those tropical waves survive off the coast of Africa, they could really use this warm, uh, those warm waters for fuel. That's what they, it's where they get their energy off of. And if they can battle off some of the winds from El Nino, they could win out. We also have very warm waters in the Gulf of Mexico. And the question is, do the storms make it into the Gulf of Mexico? Because if then, they can certainly use that as fuel as well. So lots of questions, lots of un uncertainty as we go through the next, what is it, uh, 65 and a half months. Yes, <laughs> almost there. <laughs> almost, yes, yes. So l l let's start with this question and we'll send it over to Rebecca and Alex here. The, the El Nino is a, is a pattern we only see really, it's a, it's a weather phenomenon we really only see every few years. But I feel like we're always talking about 
hot ocean temperatures. Are, are, are we not, Rebecca? And so those are two different factors. Um, we're always talking about rising ocean temperatures because people are concerned about climate change and if the ice caps melt. And so obviously rising sea surface temperatures over the entire globe would also affect the weather patterns, the wind patterns, and of course hurricane season. But when we're talking about El Nino or, Ver or La Nina specifically, we're just zeroing in on this one region in the Pacific because how the heat differs in that region drives the wind across the Atlantic and it drives some big, larger weather patterns across the entire globe. And so we, we watch that one area specifically, but now we're also adding in the fact that the Atlantic is so warm, um, unusually warm for us for this time of the year. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, and and that's going to be the like we've been talking about that that competition, right? Um, there's tons of fuel for these storms uh, in the tropical Atlantic. Uh, again, these these are are sea surface temperatures that are are sort of getting towards the top of the graph for us. But with El Nino in place, that leads to stronger wind shear, stronger winds. And what that does is, is typically sort of shear apart and knock down those storms. You want the winds around storms as they're forming to be light. Uh, but when we get these stronger El Ninos to develop, you get that stronger uh, wind shear uh, in the uh, region that you see highlighted there where, where uh, hurricanes typically develop in the Atlantic, and that tends to limit the season. But with sea surface temperatures this warm, an active uh, African monsoon season expected, it's really anybody's guess as to how this season works out. It could be a below average season or we could be really busy this year. We're going to, of course, be keeping a very close eye on it here on Tracking the Tropics. Uh, again, Alex Puckett joining us from WIAT in Birmingham, Alabama. Amanda and Rebecca with me here in the Stream Center. Uh, we're going to open up the Q&A here in just a moment, in just a moment. But we want to show everybody kind of the cheat code for getting your question on screen. You see the hashtags all around your screen. Hashtag hey, Alex, Amanda, Rebecca, and JB. If you use one of those hashtags, it's kind of a, a shortcut, if you will, to get your comment featured on our live stream. So we'll do our very best uh, to get to as many of those comments uh, just coming up but this is the money question i want to ask all three of you uh, you three being the experts uh it's on the bottom of your screen folks which is going to win in your estimations is it going to be rising ocean temperatures that's going to provide that fuel for uh for, for hurricanes or is it going to be el nino which inhibits hurricanes i'm putting you on the spot you guys want to make a make it take a gander I'll go first if you want. Yeah. Um, and this goes back to what we talked about last week with, with Hank Allen was on. And so lots of storms form outside of that region that El Nino is affecting. So those long form hurricanes, those long track hurricanes that we watch for weeks sweeping across the Atlantic, I don't think those will be the dominant feature this year because of El Nino. But I think storms that form to the west of the Caribbean, storms that form in the Gulf where the wind shear is not as big of a factor, I think that's one of the things that that we'll see this season. So I, it's not so much as one wins or loses, but they dominate different areas of of the tropics. So again, the, the trouble area is going to be the Gulf. If a, if a storm enters the Gulf and is managed, what if it's a, let's say it's a tropical wave or, or, or just a low level disturbance? Uh, are we talking about there still being perhaps factors for rapid intensification? Absolutely. Yeah, we still have very warm water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, even the loop current that we talk about, you know, from year to year, that has very warm water temperatures that those storms can feed off of. I mean, if it's a weak system moving into the Gulf of Mexico, there's going to be a lot of atmospheric uh, factors at play there. But if you have an organized system moving into the Gulf, you're going to see much, you're going to see far less impacts from El Nino on a storm that is organized in the Gulf moving toward uh, the Gulf Coast region. We're going to be talking about a, a a storm that has the possibility of that and we could still see impacts from a hurricane this year i mean uh hurricane florence and hurricane michael were both in el nino years but they were weak el ninos and obviously we know that michael was a very strong storm that impacted the panhandle um and then prior to the last 30 years we had betsy and camille uh, in the 60s that were both in el nino years and, and so just i'm following here el, we're talking about a weak el nino right How now right now it's forecast to get stronger how strong we're talking a very strong it's possible a very strong which is good look i want to make this clear for for our audience that is just trying to still grasp this concept myself included uh el, a strong el nino means 
is good for us as far as tropical development. It means that tropical yes. development is not going to be as likely. Overall, there's going to be fewer storms that form, right? So you have less chance of seeing an impact from a, a storm but overall. A, but Alex, we all know it, it just takes it just takes one to make a, a rough right. hurricane season. That applies for us in, in Tampa, Florida. That applies for the Alabama Gulf Coast, even up where you are in, in, in Birmingham as well. Absolutely. And, and I was just thinking about it before I joined the stream, you know, talking about that. Uh, a, a, an example of a below average uh, hurricane season would be 1992. Right. Only one major hurricane, only four named st or four hurricanes during that entire season. One of them was Andrew. So it, it only takes that one storm. And you, you saw the uh, four. There's the season forecast from uh, uh, NOAA and from uh, Colorado State, uh, they're forecasting a near average season, but this is a tough one. And, and it really feels like these forecasts, we're trying to split the middle here and split the difference because of those competing factors, the El Nino and uh, the, the, the really warm sea surface temperatures. I really tend to think this, is, this, this might be a feast or famine season for us. Um, and that's sort of what we've been talking about, you know, that that's the water cooler conversation in Birmingham in the weather office is um, whether or not this season might end up being really, really busy. Lots of in close development, lots of developing storms that can, you know, survive the shear in the Atlantic or the El Nino wins out. We don't get much in close development and overall it's quieter. But the, Listen, it only takes the one storm anyway. So at the end of the day, you can have what's technically a below average season, like I said, with 92. But if you have an Andrew, it's a bad year. Let, let me ask. Let me ask this one question before our, our, we have queue, uh, comments in the queue that we're going to get to here from our, our great track in the tropics audience. But uh, I want to ask this question. We have these these competing factors, right? We have El Nino, we have rising ocean temperatures. Does that at all impact the the peak of hurricane season as far as, you know, us really starting to pay even more attention to the tropics in August, September, October? We, we've seen the line graph of when storms are most commonly forming. So are we still talking about the same timeline here as well? Yeah, I mean, generally, especially if we have a, an active West African monsoon where we're seeing more of these tropical waves coming off the coast of Africa, you still got to watch each one of them to see if they survive the shear and they can feed off the warm water temperatures or hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, the shear will, uh, um, you know, tear most of them apart before they reach the areas where there's less shear to impact them. Very interesting. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> right. Exactly. Let's 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 hope. Let's hope because it would be nice. It would be nice to have a an overall quiet quiet season. Yes. Uh, we want, uh, of course, our audience to now participate. You see the hashtags all around your screen. Uh, you have three meteorologists uh, in the palm of your hand, folks. So if you're joining us on social media, especially Facebook Live, we're going to start to look now, and we have been looking over the last several minutes, our Tracking the Tropics team, paying attention to our hashtag system. It's really simple, folks. If you use one of the hashtags on your screen with your question, on Facebook Live or on social media, we can put it on screen just like this. Casey Weed on the WFLA Facebook page wants to know, hashtag hey Amanda, would storms that make it into the Gulf tend to move to the west coast of Florida? So thank you for your question there, Casey. Uh, it is going to depend on that high, that Bermuda high that we do talk about every single year. Now, during El Nino years, that high can tend to be a little smaller. Uh, so we could see that recurve be a little bit faster. And yes, that may actually favor the west coast of Florida a little bit more. Uh, but still, you're still going to see these nuances from week to week in these atmospheric factors that uh, are going to, you know, just be storm dependent. You know, the timing is going to be critical critical on each one that form. But if we see a storm, I think the, the thing that I'd be most worry, worried about this, uh, this uh, season as we go through the next few months is if a storm makes it into the Gulf, then, you know, then we could see problems. As we look here at the lists, I'm sorry, Rebecca, you were going to speak? No, it's okay. I was just saying another thing that I got a little worried about is the formation zones for this time of the year and also in October where you get those southern western Caribbean storms right. and then they, they track up towards the Gulf. I they think do, that, yeah. that might be a concern. This so year October too. could be a little bit, uh, you know, a month to watch, which we always watch in, in here in Florida for storms uh, in October, but that might be, a, a you know, a little bit more active of a month. We'll be paying 
of course, very close attention over the course of of hurricane season. As we look here at the names, uh, we have scratched our Arlene, Arlene off the uh, list of names here, but Brett. Uh, is next up as far as uh, where we are in the in the alphabet of names. We always get the question about vacations, right? Everyone wants their <laughs> vacations. And for Nancy, uh, man, she's got a cruise in the first week of July. We can't predict two weeks out, but we do know, at least according to Noah's forecast from the National Hurricane Center, that things right now, uh, I mean, looking looking so far so good, right? Yeah, quiet for the next seven days. Uh, you know, of course, we'll be watching those longer range models, but two weeks out's a little tough. Yeah, it is. It'll be hot, probably. There we go. <laughs> Which you want it to be on a cruise, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so enjoy. Uh, and, and we have uh, Gail. Uh, we're going to get to Gail's comment here in just a second. She's joining us from the WCDB Facebook page up in, uh, I believe that's is that South Carolina. That is South Carolina. Charleston. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, why is South Carolina so cool right now is the question that she's asking. And I think that she had another question as well about whether or not the current state of the tropics is contributing to any cool uh, weather at the moment. So I do know that we do have a, a very strange pattern over the entire U U.S. right now. The jet streams kind of diving really down far to the south, which is actually, um, I, I give credit to our chief meteorologist, Jeff Berardelli, for his article on WFLA.com right now about why we have cooler than normal water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean right now on the east coast of um on the east coast of the United States. And that's because of this jet stream. We have stronger winds. It's sending some, some storm systems a little bit farther south than what we would typically see this time of year, which is why it is a little bit cooler, not only in South Carolina, but actually uh, up along the northeast coast too. We have a great question. That This is the um, billion dollar question for the Tampa Bay area. And it comes in on Facebook Live from Carmen on the WFLA Facebook <laughs> page. Why does the Tampa area uh, get a, a direct hit. Alex, we would we would really love if you joined us here as we all kind of knocked on wood here together. We're all going to kind of just do it because uh, yeah. there's there's myths, superstitions, <laughs> Rebecca, Amanda, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's the burial grounds. <laughs> why? Can we answer Carmen's question? So a lot of people do think that um, t the Tampa Bay area, our, our region, our little uh, bay is protected by ancient Indian burial grounds. And that's because we haven't been hit by a storm in 100 years. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen, though. No, several factors have to come together yes. and it has to be perfect timing for the Tampa Bay area to get hit. But that being said, it's come together twice just mm -hmm. to the south of us, right. Charlie and then Ian last year. Right. And so there's no reason that we wouldn't get hit. Uh, a, basically, a front needs to be pulling in or the Bermuda high just needs to be in the perfect positions to sling that, the curvature of it into Tampa. And so it would take per a perfect system to do that the timing just has to be key whether mm -hmm. you're seeing a front coming down from the north recurving um a storm like we saw with charlie uh that front just has to be positioned just in the right spot for it to recurve uh, right into the tampa bay region but again it's just up and down the west coast of florida we're just it, 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 everything is timing is everything for florida Alex, any weird superstitions in Alabama that don't have to do with Roll Tide or War Eagle? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and this is something it's nice to hear, I guess, that it's not just a severe weather thing and a tornado thing. It's a hurricane thing, too. We, we get these, uh, you know, anytime I go out in the community, a different town, I hear about, well, you know, I always heard our town can't get hit because of this hill or this mountain or, 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 or some sort of geographical feature. Um, in fact, the town I grew up in here in Alabama, that, that was that was what uh, a lot of people would always say. Oh, the mountain keeps us from getting any tornadoes, but we do get them. It, it, there's nowhere safe. Uh, in fact, the town I grew up in, uh, the town right next door, Silicaga, everybody said, Silicaga, you can't get hit by a tornado because of the mountain. Uh, but if you went back to the 1920s, they got hit by an F4. So yeah, we get the same thing uh, just off the coast too. It, it, the superstitions hold strong everywhere, I guess. Yeah, it's like it's like the curse of the Billy Goat or the curse of the, of the you know, with the Boston Red Sox, the Chicago Cubs. It, 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 it's a curse until all of a sudden it isn't. So right. let's, let's hope right. that the Indian burial grounds in Tampa remains uh, <laughs> the protecting... 
uh, force that uh, that prevents these but storms from hitting us. prepare anyway. <laughs> yes, that's, we just did a whole episode last week, uh, Rebecca and Amanda sharing their hurricane hacks to stay prepared. So we're not saying that, right. you know, your tool for preparation is to pray for, you know, for the Indian burial grounds. We're not saying that. Yes. Do that as well, but also prepare. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to close our meteorologist q and I want to wrap up the episode by just giving everyone here our three experts on screen. Meteorologists Rebecca Barry, Amanda Holly, and Alex Puckett joining us from Birmingham. Uh, just an opportunity. As far as we're going to be tracking this now, El Nino versus rising ocean temperatures, we're going to be keeping an eye on this. What are some of the things that you as meteorologists, we'll start with you, Rebecca, are going to be monitoring as far as these two, um, you know, competing patterns, if you will, over the course of the next several months. And so I think what the telling factors for me that I'm going to be keeping my eye on is when the thunderstorms do start to roll off the coast of Africa and do start to swirl. That's what I'm going to be watching for. How are they affected by the shear? And you're also going to be looking at those pockets of warmer water. And when they hit those pockets of warmer water, do they perform better against the shear? And so this is really, you know, science has never been perfect, and it's certainly not now. But this gives us an opportunity to potentially assign a value to the fuel of, of a warmer sea surface temperature versus shear and, and maybe advance the science a little bit more and, and help us know even more so what the season is going to be like when these factors are in play again. Amanda, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty interesting. You know, a lot of times with weather patterns, when we look that far out, you know, six months, we, we actually look back in history because uh, things tend to happen the same way that they have happened in the past with weather patterns. But we really don't have a lot to compare what we're looking at in the next five and a half months too, because we've never had water temperatures this warm, uh, coupled with, you know, possibly a really strong El Nino with these competing factors. So I do think that there's a lot of uncertainty and I think that we are gonna have to watch each storm in particular and how they react to these different atmospheric fa factors. You know, does a storm develop over the next few months? Does it survive the shear that maybe isn't quite there yet? And then, you know, we look at maybe a little bit quieter of a, of a main development time, like a quieter September, but then we do see a little bit more of a, a an active October closer to home. So uh, the main thing I'm gonna be watching for are those storms that, that will try and get closer to home. What about you, Alex? I think you get typically in an El Nino, you look for two things. Number one, you look for enclosed development, right? Storms that develop closer to home, uh, those aren't necessarily going to be as impacted by the shear. So a storm that forms, say, closer to the Caribbean and slides into the Gulf, um, that would be something to watch out for, particularly at the front end and back end of the season. Um, and then the second thing I would look out for, and this is just always a red flag for me, if you've got strong shear, but a, a wave can survive that and get past it and get closer and it doesn't get torn apart and, and it can maintain itself, those are usually the ones that end up being trouble for us. So El Nino, strong shear, it's going to be difficult to forecast these and, and Hopefully, these waves have a really difficult time battling strong shear, but the ones that can survive it could be problematic for us. Alex Puckett joining us from WIT, CBS 42 in Central Alabama. Alex, we really appreciate your time and your expertise in joining us here on, on Track in the Tropics. Thanks so much for having me. Had a great time. All right. And of course, uh, you can always visit folks trackingthetropics.tv for any storm updates. The latest track and models, hurricane preparedness. We just did our entire episode of Track in the Tropics powered by Bose Electric talking about hurricane hacks and how you get ready now before all the toilet paper and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bottles of water get sold out at your local uh, grocery store. Everything you need to know, some of the best tricks from our weather team here at WFLA and as part of Next Star Nation, you can find it all on trackingthetropics.tv. For Alex, Rebecca, Amanda, I'm JB. Thanks so much for joining us on Tracking the Tropics. We stream, of course, Wednesdays at 1230 Eastern, 1130 Central, and when storms form. We'll see you next time again on Tracking the Tropics. Find Tracking the Tropics on these platforms. And for storm updates, the latest models, and helpful resources, visit trackingthetropics.tv.